and I call Mr. John O'Dowd. Uh, Gourmet, I've got to uh, last can call your case over here. Question number one. Minister. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And if I may indulge your house, I may ask for an extra minute on this one. Um, the New Decade New Approach Agreement gave a commitment that the Executive would produce a new ca- cancer strategy by the end of December 2020, and I intend to see that commitment delivered. However, my department began developing the new strategy in June last year, using a co production approach from the outset to maximise the patient's voice. The strategy will focus on fewer people getting preventable cancers, more people surviving for longer after diagnosis, and improving the experience of care for cancer patients. Development of the strategy is overseen by a steering group, membership of which was drawn from a wide range of sectoral stakeholders from across Northern Ireland, including the voluntary sector, those with lived experience, clinicians and subject experts. The steering group itself is co-chaired by the Chief Nursing Officer and a lived experience representative. The steering group is supported by seven themed subgroups, each led by a sectoral expert and co-chaired by a lived experience representative. The development of the cancer strategy has been taken forward in three phases. Phase one looked at where we are now in terms of current services, with each subgroup providing an overview of how and where services are currently delivered. Subgroups also develop an aspirational statement of what an optimised service would look like. So phase two involved those subgroups using the outputs of phase one to identify a gap analysis, which provides an indication of what is required to achieve a high-performing cancer service. Phase three commenced this month and will see subgroups begin the development of options and recommendations for actions. Taken together, these three phases will form the basis for the new draft 10-year cancer strategy and a fully costed implementation plan will be developed following the recommendations being approved. Call Mr O'Dowd for a supplementary question. Uh, I would like to call you and thank the Minister for his response. When the Department announced that it was going to uh, produce a new cancer strategy, it referred to looking at best practices in neighbouring jurisdictions, and it particularly focused in in relation to NHS England. There it involved the establishment of an independent cancer task force. While I appreciate the work of the the review body is ongoing, and the Minister has given us a breakdown of that, is the Department still minded to go in that direction of travel in terms of an independent or, or sorry, a cancer task force. And I suppose, in, in regards to the work we're doing in the strategy in the three phases that we approached, one of the main topics we've taken in the direction of this is actually in co- co-production to make sure that the lived experience um, individuals have an input into this. In regards to the specific task force, we'll look at that as to how we develop the cancer strategy and see if there's a need for that at this point in time to make sure that we have a consistent approach across the whole of the UK and also with our counterparts in the Republic of Ireland. Call Mr Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Sp- uh, Speaker. Minister, in relation to implementation plans, I know you and this House will be very aware of the uh, worldwide concerns there is in relation to coronavirus. Breaking news just uh, out, uh, Minister, is that pupils from Banbridge Academy have been sent home amid fears uh, following a, a school trip to Italy. Can the Minister give an urgent update to the House? Minister. Um, I, I, I thank the member for, for a supplementary. I know it is straying slightly from, from, the, from the original question, but I am prepared to, I am prepared to update. Look, we are in a fast-moving um, situation, and the case definition regarding the areas concerned at risk has recently changed in regards to Italy. Uh, so up our updated guidance will be issued to healthcare professionals, professionals later today. But in the meantime, I think if anybody has concern, they should check the Public Health Authority or Agency's website, which will direct any individual to the most updated uh, guidance. Uh, schools were issued guidance on the 17th of February, and this will now be updated to reflect uh, what is happening today. It is, of course, up to any principal of any school to decide whether or not they believe they should close their school. But based on the latest, latest information, I believe it is unlikely at this stage that any school would have to close if they follow the latest guidance, but our officials are working with Public Health Agency and the Education Authority to make sure all of the schools in Northern Ireland who have been on skiing trips in parts of Italy, whether they're infected areas or not, are given the most up-to-date guidance. Call Mr Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, you may have seen the Cancer Research UK report uh, today 
concerning smoking prevalence projections for all nations of the UK. And within that, regrettably, it states that it does not feel Northern Ireland is going to achieve smoke-free status until the late 2040s. Uh, can the Minister please outline what he is planning to do to get this back on track to achieve the target of 2035? Thank you. Well, in regards to how we prevent smoking and how we, we de-escalate those who actually take up smoking uh, as, uh, as a direction of travel, um, I think there's a major piece of work, work has to be done um, in regards to actually the education of, of our young people in regards and how we get back on track is one of the, the things that the concert strategy and the groups involved will need to be looking at and bringing into context as well to make sure that any of those causes are actually looked at as well, and that's why we look at how, how we address and ensure that we take the direction that we actually challenge preventable cancers to make sure we don't get to that stage, and the smoking sensation is one of those, those actions. Minister, thank you for your response, and I look forward to further developments of your cancer strategy. Can you confirm whether patients in Northern Ireland, Minister, now have the same access to cancer drugs as those across the rest of the United Kingdom? And I thank the member for her, for her supplementary. On the 12th of September 2018, my department announced that promising new medicines which have been available to patients in the rest of the UK will now be available to patients in Northern Ireland. What that means in practice is that all those new medicines that have entered the Reform Cancer Drugs Fund since 2016 will now be available for patients in Northern Ireland. This new approach will ensure that drugs approved by the National Institute of Clinical Ex Excellence for use through the Cancer Drug Fund in England will now be considered in line with existing arrangements for Northern Ireland ind endorsement of NICE recommendations. And accordingly, patients here will have the same access to cancer drugs as their counterparts in other parts of the UK region. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, Minister, just for clarification, can you confirm that the process you described at the end, that you anticipate there being a cancer strategy, and if so, what the timeline would be before that then would be rolled out in terms of delivery? Well, in regards, will I confirm, I already did, I think, in, in the first part of my question, uh, new decade, new approach. I actually said that the executive should deliver a cancer strategy by December 2020, and that's what we are committed to doing. It's what I'm personally committed to doing as well. And in regards to how we've taken this piece of work through co-production, it's what I think the lived experience individuals expect from us as elected representatives. So depending on the recommendations that come out from that point, we'll set our timeline from then as well, because we'll have, we'll have to ensure that there is relevant funding there at that point in time. Call Mr. Leah Flynn. Gormi, I'll get last. Can call you case ever a doll. Question number two, please. Okay. Um, I thank the member for her for her question. Current indications that we have are that the multi-agency triage teams programme is working very effectively in Belfast and the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust areas. An evaluation report is expected in March, which will inform the future development of this service. A uh, wider rollout will be dependent then upon additional funding being made avail available and commitment from delivery partners. Options for a wider rollout would include moving from the existing two-day operation to a seven-day-a-week operation and also extension to all the other three health and social care trust areas. Ms Flynn, for a supplementary. Um, I would like to thank Minister Swan for his response. Um, and just given the positive cross agency working thus far between the PSNI and health and social care staff, not just in the example of the street triage, but also in the pilots around the custody suites, um, can the Minister elaborate on any discussions your department has had with the PSNI to ensure the continued rollout of these important projects? Uh, and I thank the member for supplementary. And of course, the work we're doing in the custody suites is equally valuable because people going into custody suites don't always need to see a custody officer. Sometimes that health professional who can interact with them at that point of detention can prevent an awful lot of things going an awful lot worse. And it's something I've committed actually to working with my ministerial colleague in justice to make sure there is a further enhancement of that, of that programme. And, and again, it will depend on where funding falls, because I know at this minute in time, PSNI would like us to pick up the entire cost of that facility and um, provision, but it's something that is working and I think it's something we need to develop again across, across the executive. Mr. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers today. Uh, can the Minister advise on progress of the new Executive Group on Mental Health uh, and, advise the and assure the House on the Department's commitment going forward on addressing the, the real problem we have in Northern Ireland relating to mental health, especially amongst young people? And I, I thank the member for, for a supplementary look. And I will say to the member, he doesn't have to question me or my department on their commitment in regards to how we address the mental health issue here in Northern Ireland, and especially with young people. And in regards to, I, I think, the executive working group that we have established is due to meet within, within the next couple of weeks. And it's one thing that I think sends a very strong signal out from this House is the willingness from all my ministerial colleagues to engage in addressing what is a man, uh, um, the mental health issue that we have here in Northern Ireland. Because as one of my predecessors actually said, every minister is a health minister. And in fact, in this minute in time, every minister is a mental health minister as well, because there's so much can be done across each department in regards to mental health. Should it be from early interventions in education? Should it be from the provision of free green space in the Department of Agriculture? Should it be those structures and infrastructure that the Department, the department of Infrastructure can provide at certain points in, in, in Northern Ireland that, that could challenge or could prevent an individual going in a certain direction? So it's a commitment I don't think the member has to question, because it was, I think it's one that I'm assured of that I have cross executive support and as one as definitely not won't be found wanting in me. Speaker, given that mental health is obviously a priority for the Minister, uh, will the Minister do all he can to ensure that the groups, mental health groups that are struggling to stay open, uh, such as Compass Counselling on the Shankle, will uh, be supported by the Minister to hopefully stay open and will he commit to doing all he can to support uh, such groups? And I, I thank the member for a supplementary and I acknowledge the, the support he has given to Compass Counselling at this minute in time. I mean, I'm aware there's, there is a rally coming up on Saturday in regard to looking for, for support of Compass Counselling. But I, I would say, you know, health and social care organisations work closely with many organisations to provide a range of services in the community. And all such services are funded in line with the public procurement policy. And I hope he can appreciate that it's not possible to provide funding to organisations outside that framework. I am aware the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust is due to hold a tendering exercise to produce counselling services in the coming financial year. And Compass Counselling, like other organisations, are invited to submit a tender to provide those services. And I would suggest to the directors of Com Compass Counselling that they engage with the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust, and I am sure the member will be able to support them in any bid they might come on forward, because I am aware of the work they are doing, and I am aware of the member of the support that he has given them as well. Um, just if the Minister could confirm going forward, given the conversations that we have had today around the budget, that pilot schemes that are being run with other ministerial colleagues, we need to look at, at the point at which we are implementing the pilot scheme, how it will be funded going into the future, because these pilot schemes are excellent, but are we wasting money running pilot schemes where we have no plans on how to fund them going forward? Minister. No. Again, I, I thank the member for, for a very valid point, and it's something that, since taken up op office, I've often heard from a number of areas across the health and social care system, where pilot schemes start to go, do very, very good work, but then the continuation of funding is not always there, not always guaranteed. And I think, again, with working with the finance minister as well, it's, it's the challenge that we have as an executive when we work on a one-year budget. Because when we work on a one-year budget, we often create these pilots and schemes to test out a very good project. But if we were getting to a stage where we would three or four year concurrent budget, and we can give those organisations who buy in and those parts of the health service who invest a lot of time, energy, effort and manpower into what we classify as pilots, so we can do them for a short space of time. If we had a three or four year budget process, it would give those organisations a lot more certainty in what they're doing but it would also allow us as a department and our health service time to transform and use those pilots as part of our transformation project so we can actually bring about the changes that we want to see in our health and social care service. Uh, Mr Philip McGuigan is not in his place, but if we all crack on, it was a grouped question at number 12. We might get to Mr Durkin at number 12. I call Mr Pat Shane. I got the three last concord. Kesh Dever Cahar, question four. Thank you very much, 
Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, work to complete the resettlement of patients remaining in Muckamore Abbey Hospital is ongoing. As of the 17th of February 2020, there were 53 patients in Muckamore Abbey Hospital, um, and that includes two patients currently transitioning to new places of residence. Twelve of these remaining patients are there from the priority target list for resettlement. The priority list was defined by the Bamford Review as those patients who had been resident in hospital for at least a year as of the 1st of April 2007. This is a reduction of 223 from the original cohort of 235 patients identified by Bamford at that point of the review. Although much progress has been made on completing the resettlement programme, I have made clear my commitment to continue to reduce lengthy hospital emissions by supporting people to live sustainably in local communities in line with the vision set by Bamford, Equal Lives Report and more recently the Bangor Review. But to deliver on this, a regional learning disability operational delivery group chaired by the Health and Social Care Board and reporting to the Muckamore Departmental Assurance Group has been established to coordinate a regional approach to the resettlement of the inpatient population at Muckamore. While, res while resettlement is an important issue, the welfare of the patient is paramount, and that will mean that one size may not always fit all. Call Mr. Sheehan for a supplementary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Agra. Thank the Minister for his answer. Um, uh, you'll be aware, Minister, that the Department announced a plan at the start of last year to have all patients in Muckamore resettled by the end of last year. And having spoken to many people in the learning disability sector, uh, that was a totally unrealistic proposition. The Department were told that and ignored it. Uh, and I hope the Minister uh, has the requisite funding to ensure that as many patients as possible can be resettled in the community. And for many of those patients that have been institutionalised for a long period of time, that will, will require bespoke support services within the community, and in many instances, uh, bespoke accommodation also. So I wonder, can the Minister confirm whether uh, funding has been secured for a plan like that? And I think, going back to the member's first point in regards to that timeline, I think it was unacceptable and probably unachievable because as we've seen and as I said in my earlier approach the welfare of the patient is paramount so when we are looking at resettlement opportunities we have to make sure they are fit for purpose and the, not only the patient but the family is being supported in those resettlement options as well so in, in regards to funding we are looking at how we, we go forward in a holistic approach across the, the entirety of Northern Ireland in regards to resettlement but one thing I will say about the patients in Mucklemore is that we have to give them the full support that we possibly can, both from the, in this House and as a department, to make sure that any who avail of resettlement or, and are eligible to resettlement are fully supported and are going to places that are fit for their purpose. I call the chairperson of the Health Committee, Mr. Colin Gildernew. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer. And just as a follow up to uh, Pat Shane's question, can the Minister consider the issue of inappropriate admissions and acknowledge that working with families closely and in, in good time can prevent inappropriate admissions from which many of the long-stay residents of Muckmore have, have come? And could I ask the Minister to commit to, that he will look at the trusts uh, budgeting in terms of learning disability underspend, where monies that have been allocated to help parents and carers to support people at home have been underspent to the tunes of millions of pounds, that that will not happen in the future. Uh, I'm going back to, to what I said previously to the member, and, and the chair makes a very valid point. It's how we support the families and the patients who are currently there to our, our, our full potential to make sure that any facility or any place they're going to for resettlement is fit for purpose and just provide that, that engagement with the family. Um, in regards to the resettlement proce progress and process, I think there is a piece of work that the Trust is already doing in regards to how it engages with families and with parents. Um, I have now met families twice in regards to, um, in regards to Muckamore. Resettlement has been an issue that has been raised and it is something that, that we have been looking into very seriously. In regards to the underspend, I will have a look at that. I, I was not I wasn't aware of that exact budget line until the Chair realised it, but I'll go and look at that now and I'll get back to the member on that. I call the Deputy Chair of the Health Committee, Mrs Pam Cameron. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far on this question. Uh, my question to the Minister leading on, um, obviously uh, we'll be aware that well, none of us want to see anybody with a postcode in, in Muckamore Abbey Hospital. That is unacceptable, but we do have to be very uh, conscious that some of the individuals, especially now, um, the, the amount of individuals who are left in Muckamore and have not been resettled, it will be because they, they are very complex cases. And I would just ask the Minister to assure this House that, um, that much care is taken when um, assessing individuals' uh, suitability to be resettled in the community, that that assessment is absolutely correct before attempting resettlement, because it is highly distressing if it doesn't work out and they end up returning to Muckamore Abbey. Yeah. And again, you know, the Deputy Chair's point is well made, and I think that's where that piece of work around resettlement is vital, as, and that is actually is how we engage and engage more in the families, because if a family is saying to, to professionals sitting around a table that their loved one is not ready at this minute in time to be resettled, that input has to be listened to and that input has to be actioned on, and it's some of the assurances that, that I've been given uh, in regards when we look at, the, I suppose, the unsuccessful level of resettlement we have seen in Muckamore in the past. So it's something that is a live issue and it's something that we're aware of. It's something that the, the trust team and the leadership team that are now in place around Muckamore are, are, are working on to make sure that any resettlement, as I said earlier, um, is fit for purpose because one size will not fit all. And at the heart of this, the welfare of the patient is paramount. I call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you. Principal Deputy Speaker, can the Minister uh, provide an update with regards to the establishment of a public inquiry into Muckermore uh, Abbey Hospital? Um, and, I, and I thank the member um, for a supplementary. Um, I've made it clear that patients and families have a right to answers on what went so appallingly wrong at Muckamore. And I clearly have a decision to make on establishing the best process to provide those answers. My decision has to be an informed one, so I'm carefully considering detailed advice from my officials on what we know about what happened at Muckamore and on options going forward. Of course, any decision I take will be informed by the views of the people who use the services at Muckamore and their families. And that is why I have already visited the hospital to meet with patients, families, carers and staff to hear from them as early as possible. And I recently met with Action for Muckamore. It is important to note that any process that is put in place to provide the answers that we need will clearly have to take cognizance of the ongoing major PSNI investigation. I call Mr Harry Harvey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question five. Thank you. I again thank the member um, for his question. Um, my department's policy aims to ensure the effective provision of car parking across all the health estates for patients, visitors and staff. Decisions on how the policy is applied is for each health and social care trust to determine. In that regard, changing is an important mechanism on sites where space is limited to control uh, demand and to ensure sufficient spaces for patients and visitors. Charging also helps cover the cost of the provision and maintenance of car parking, including the associated security costs. And I recognise that charging for car parking on our hospital and other healthcare sites is a difficult and emotive issue. But if charging were to stop, these costs associated would need to be met from elsewhere within the health budget, which would reduce the amount of money I would have available to fund patient care. Thank you. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you for your answer, Minister Swan. I believe that in Scotland and Wales they do not pay for hospital parking, and in England they offer concessions to staff and patients. Going forward, can we be assured that car parking facilities across the health trust will be accessible for staff and patients, and that capacity will be considered, particularly in upgrades or future new facilities? Patients and visitors who travel to hospitals from many parts of Northern Ireland often endure long delays and queues while waiting for a parking space. Parking at hospitals should be a simple exercise, not a stressful one, our goal being to make life easier for everyone. Thank you. Minister. Okay. And look, and I, I, I thank the member for his point as well made, and I don't think it's anything that hasn't been raised with any constituency. Um, MLA, uh, as, as I said, the policy as set by the department is then applied by each health and social care trust as 
as how they see fit. So criteria for car parking therefore does vary from site to site and be, it can be more stringently applied at some restricted areas where there is difficulty in parking or a lack of parking spaces. And the process is intended to help trust balance the interests of patients, public and staff and apply the agreed criteria as fairly and uh, as equally as possible. Um, the member may have an interest in, in the Ulster Hospital because of no plans that are in place to construct a new 149 space car park adjacent to the new acute services block at the Ulster Hospital and that facility uh, will provide accessible car parking for patients and visitors attending the ED and wards and the new car park will be operational prior to the opening of the acute services block. Well, yeah. I would ask the Minister, uh, listening to his answer there, um, that while he agrees that there's variations in terms of uh, different uh, areas, different hospitals, and that, is, is he as a Minister going to do anything or at least inquire into how you bring the variations down so that there is a fair price, if we can't do away with the price, a fair charge for everyone who uses these hospitals? Um, I thank the member for, for the point he makes, and, and there are a number of trusts and a number of areas that do provide free car parking, so I suppose his direction of travel, if I was to go down that way, would they see car parking charges across all, all health facilities? If that's what he's suggesting, um, I, I, I'll, I'll raise it with trusts, but at this minute in time it's up to them how do they interpret the department policy on, on car parking charges. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answers thus far. Um, we drive far too much in Northern Ireland, and while uh, in the context of hospitals, clearly there will be patients who will need to use transportation in order to get there, and clearly there will be nurses and medical staff who work irregular shifts, and quite often they're exhausted and finishing at odd times. But notwithstanding those groups, what is his department doing to incentivise either administrative staff within hospitals or families who are visiting to, where possible, not use their cars in order to get to hospitals, to use public transport or to use their own feet, if possible? Well, look, in regards to encouraging um, patients and visitors to use public transport, it, I, I'm happy to have the conversation with this party colleague in infrastructure to see how we can increase and support public transport, should it be buses or trains, to, to those facilities within the Northern or the Health and Social Care Trust that are accessible. In regards to, to walking to, to hospital, often many people who need to walk to go to hospital aren't fit to walk there, so that's why, why they need to use. But again, for those who are visiting, I, I would no encourage a, a healthy lifestyle at any point. But in regards to the, the encouragement of public transport, it's something I'm definitely I'll, I'll take up with his ministerial colleague. Mr Alan Chambers. Deputy Principal Speaker, uh, I thank the Minister for his response and I, ideally I suspect that the Minister would prefer that uh, all of our health facilities to have sufficient space to allow visitors and staff to park for free, but unfortunately for some the space is so limited that it's just not an option. Can the Minister uh, sort of give us a, a flavour of how much uh, income uh, is raised uh, by these car parking space uh, charges? I thank the member for his question. Um, our 1819 figures, which are the last four ones we have available, um, show that car parks actually raised a revenue of 7.5 million. Um, the cost of running those car parks was actually 8.8 .8 million. And these figures show that the cost of car parking is not being fully recovered across all trusts. And as a result, my department have been engaged with trusts over the last year to ensure that the money required to run car parks is recovered from their use so that additional funding can be available, made available to fund patient services. We have literally 30 seconds, so it needs to be a 15-second question, a 15-second answer. Kelly Armstrong. Hmm. Just going to ask the Minister for Health, if he's committed to the health and well-being of people, could he assure that all any buildings of health trust or any other health um, will be inclusive of buses so that the roads are wide enough for the bus lanes, please? Because otherwise we cannot have public transport coming to hospitals. Minister. I will take into consideration any design of new hospitals coming forward will make sure they're accessible for public transport. How is that for a commitment? Excellent. Well done. Well done. Um, I, we now move on to topical questions to the Minister for Health. The first member on my list is Ms Gemma Dolan. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the priorities he has set out in his capital spending plans for rural GP practices? 
Sorry, could you repeat the last part of the question? Apologies. Um, it's an update on the priorities you've set out on your capital spending plans for rural GP practices. In, reg in regards to, to rural GP practices, we have a number of areas that we now see clearly are struggling to not just attract rural GPs, but also maintain them in a facility that is fit for purpose in the service they are delivering. So we have a detailed piece of work, and if the member was happy, I could write to her with a more detailed breakdown of to, to the areas that we are actually going to invest in and where we could do that, if that would be done. Ms Dolan, for a supplementary. Um, can the Minister communicate with the Health and Social Care Board and the Western Trust to request an update on the plans for the health centres in Carrickmore and Lisnesky? Um, certainly. Look, in regards to, to listening ski, I, I know the business case is actually well developed and somewhere that we, we should be, be ready to go on, on very, very soon once we get agreement on the site. In regards to the other one, I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but again, I commit to write to the member with the detail of that exact request. Call Mr William Irvin. To Deputy Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I ask the Minister, in light of the chronic shortages of nurses and the lengthy process in training new nurses, would the Minister consider implementing a financial incentive to get nurses whose registration has lapsed back into the system and enter our hospital wards in a fraction of the time it takes to train new staff? Um, I'm not sure if, if the members are aware, but we have commissioned a, a very detailed report um, that was taken forward by Sir Richard Barnett in regards to nursing and midwifery. He has come forward with a number of recommendations as to how we, we support our nurses and midwives currently in the profession and how we make sure the skill shortage is, is actually maintained uh, and we get to a place where we're filling the 2,700 vacancies that we currently have within our nursing profession. I'm not sure if one of those recommendations is a financial incentive, but if it's not, it's something that I'll, I'll look at. It's not something I can guarantee to the member here now that it's something we can bring forward, but it's definitely a valid suggestion that we will consider. Thank the Minister for his response. Can I ask the Minister, does he accept that new approaches need to be made to, to deal with the situation of the shortage of nurses in Northern Ireland? And as I said to the member, it's something we're, we're well aware of uh, in regards to how we retain the nursing staff that we already have, but make sure it's also an attractive profession for people to go into. And I think that, okay, under New Decade, New Approach, we have the, the executive commitment for those 900 additional places over the next three years, on top of the 1,025 training places we do have. That goes some way to fill the gap, but it won't address the current shortage that we have now. So how we can re-engage, um, I, I suppose, nurses who have just stepped out of the profession is a very, is a very valid point. And I think it also ties into a very welcome announcement by some of our health unions yesterday, where they actually said you know, that suspended industrial action on the back of the work that we have been able to do, both as a department and as an executive, and showing the support to our nurses in regards to pay parity, but also to give them the indication that we're, we're, we're working towards safe staffing. And that's across all sectors of our health and social care staff, not just the nurses, but I think it goes to give a very clear indication as to how much we value not just our nurses, especially our nurses, but also the rest of the health professionals within our health and social care boards and trusts. Well, Deputy Speaker, uh, Minister, within my constituency in Foyle, uh, we've had the devastating loss of far too many young people and people of all ages. Uh, I'm sure the Minister would agree that uh, one life lost is one too many. Uh, would the Minister outline uh, what his department is doing to ensure that much needed mental health support and funding is provided to crisis intervention services in London Derry? No, and again, um, in regards to the, me the member's comment, it's a line that I've used myself and it's a line that I believe one life lost to suicide is, is one too many. In regards to, I, I suppose, the specifics of the crisis intervention services in Londonderry, um, I've just recently approved a £27,000 transformation slippage allowance to Derry Crisis Intervention Service to allow uh, a bridge funding until the end of March. A multi-agency meeting led by Derry and Scribbon District, District Council will be required uh, to consider funding options for 2021, um, but the Department has committed to an action within the Protect Life 2 suicide prevention strategy to provide timely, accessible 
and de-escalation services for those in emotional crisis or despair. Less than a range of other actions within the strategy will be dependent upon additional funding being made available. Uh, and following the evaluation of the Dairy Crisis Intervention Service, Belfast Crisis De-escalation Service and the MAT teams will work further to do that. There are a wide range of suicide prevention and emotional health and wellbeing services that are currently provided in the area and Lifeline 24-7 Helpline is available for anyone who is in distress or despair. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister uh, for his response? I do welcome the funding, and I'm sure he'll join with me in paying tribute to all of the organisations who do fantastic work in the area of mental health and suicide. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that the short term funding, uh, which ties us over to March, whilst it's welcome, we need to look at a long term sustainable model to ensure that uh, the, the tragedies that we have seen over this past number of days and weeks, that those are brought down and that we get to a point where there's no suicide within our society? You know, and again, you know, the member does make, make a valid point, and it was one that was raised earlier in regards to, to funding. Uh, if I had a three, four year surety of budget, it makes the valuable work that has been done by the voluntary and community sector, who are being supported by the department and other, all other funding streams, that the work they do is valued, recognised, and can continue and can have, have surety. When it comes to uh, how we challenge mental health uh, and the prevention of suicide. It's about how we actually join up the dots in Northern Ireland. It's how we bring the voluntary and community service, working in partnership with those in the health and social care trusts and also support families and individuals at that point in time. And that is a vital piece of work that our voluntary and community service sector actually does in regards to that vital piece of work in preventing suicide. I call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you. The Minister will be aware that the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister wish to spend £11 million of resources each year on Irish language and related provision. How many new nurses would £11 million per annum employ? Um, I, I thank the member uh, for his question. Um, off, off, the top of, off the top of my head, and, and these, these figures could be verified, I think a, a band five nurse um, pay salary in the region of 25,000 additional costs, moving up to 40,000, um, 275 per year, if my math is, is, is correct, but again, that could be needed to be verified. I, I did maths at school and the like. So. That was excellent. Well done. Uh, Mr Alistair. Congratulate the Minister on his maths and the presumption he's right. <laughs> but um, is it not a very perverse reflection on priorities if in the straitened circumstances in which our present budget exists, particularly in his department, uh, if we were to take eleven million pounds of such scarce resources and each year squander it on unnecessary matters while a department like his goes short, if that situation comes about and if if his executive colleagues persist with that squander Will he remain a member of that executive? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, and I thank the member for congratulating me on his ma and, my, and my maths. In regards to whether I remain a member of the executive, um, the Ulster Unionist Party are there by right, by a number to hunt. So we will stay there to, to maintain our place. If there's at any point we have to withdraw, we will consider that um, as a party. That is not my decision. That will be one for the party. But in regards to funding for the Department of Health, I have already made it clear where our current, lean, current needs are, and that is at £661 million pound, um, to maintain where we are, but also see the other commitments that are there under New Decade, New Approach, and it is something I have been working with other ministerial colleagues to ensure we get that funding. But in regards to, to funding our health service, um, I will say to the member, and I say to any member in this house, I don't think there's a health minister who has ever stood in this place who has said they've had enough money. 
So any money that is coming towards my department will be fully welcomed and fully utilised. I asked the Minister, can he confirm the capital and resource is in place for the Graduate Entry Medical School in McGee and when we can expect official sign-off from him? Um, I thank the member um, for her, her question and, and if she indulges me, if I can find, I think I, I had a recent update. We did actually get, just before coming down in here, we had an update from uh, the Northern Ireland Office, uh, Minister Robin Walker, who has actually given us clarification as to regards to the breakdown of revenue and capital. And as these great big files, I'm unable to find it at this minute in time, but I will supply it to, to the member once we have it. In regards to the business cases, um, the member should be aware there are two business cases currently. In regards to a medical school at McGee, there's one that sits with the Ulster, Universi the Ulster University that my department has helped develop and formulate. There's also a second one in regards to the number of medical training places that actually sits with my department. Now, I'm, I'm aware that that is due to come to me shortly, so it's how we get those two business cases to the same place at the same point in time, because it is actually an executive decision, because the Graduate Medical School at McGee has cross-influence with the Department of Health, the Department of the Economy, and the Department of Finance. Call Ms Mullen for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer and for his continued support in the project that I previously provided um, as leader of his party. And I would like to invite the Minister Duderi to meet with the stakeholders involved. Certainly welcome the, the, the member's invitation if, and if she can find a space in my diary, I'm more than glad to come up and visit <laughs> London Diary. <laughs> Minister, when he will address the shortfall in funding for community pharmacy services as identified in the cost of services report, which was published in 2017, but was for the year 2011, some nine years ago. Um, again, in, in regards to um, community pharmacy, um, the member may be aware that actually, as of from last night, um, community pharmacy unfortunately has decided to take um, industrial action um, and it is very disappointing for me um, that those contractors have voted to take industrial action at this time, particularly by active discussions were ongoing with their representatives. Um, I, I, I was due and I'm already due to meet Community Pharmacy Northern Ireland in the coming weeks, which means the timing of, of last night or today's announcement. It is regrettable for me because I would like to have had more enga engagement, but that threat of industrial action is likely to, to unnecessarily cause anxiety to some patients, and I want to, to reassure those patients, like Community Pharmacy, that we are fully engaged and the Department will be fully engaged with working with them to make sure that we come about to a resolution of, of something that I'd hopefully, hopefully does not actually come about. The Minister has alluded to the, my, the point I was going to make my second question, and that is 98 per cent of the community pharmacy contractors in attendance uh, voted for industrial action. That shows you the measure and strength of frustration within this industry. Uh, and the Minister must realise that frustration and try all he can to resolve this issue speedily. Look, and, and the, again, the, the member's point is well made. And, you know, wh when I came into this office, we were under the same, the same stress and duress as with, with, with our health union. So, look, working together with, with the board, um, with department officials, and with community pharmacy, I would like to see this issue resolved before any action is actually necessary. But that will involve engagement by everyone, which, which I believe there is a willingness to do, because nobody wants to go to a stage where they're actually taking industrial action because community pharmacy do provide essential services and valuable services to our community. You have 20 seconds, so it will be one question and one answer. Mr McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And the early detection of diabetic retinopathy is critical to mitigate against the impact of the condition. The Down Hospital is an ideal location for such a provision. Could it be considered, and the supplementary was that at a meeting last week, <laughs> Uh, the, the Down Community Health Committee would Member like to have a delegation to question. meet with yourself. Would that be possible? Um, I, I thank the member for his question. Certainly, I, 
I'll, I'll take up the invitation to meet if, again when, when we can fit it in. But look, just to be aware, the diabetic eye screening programme in the Downpatrick area is currently a mobile service provided by screener and graders employed by the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust, and the service visits individual GP practice who actually host the screening. So any screening del delivered on the Down Hospital site is carried out in association with the on-site GP practice, rather than as the local trust delivering service. And that model remains in place with screening continuing to be carried out on the site in, in recent months. And a project led by the Public Health Agency is being established to take forward the implementation of recommendations on, future, on the future delivery based on the findings from a public consultation which was carried out in 2019. It's a down recorder shorted for Thursday. <laughs> now, uh, could I ask members to just take their ease while there's a change at the table? Thank you.